here we are. Hey. Bob, thanks so much for sitting with me for this conversation. Absolutely. I think Absolutely. Happy to do this it. This is a great way. We're about halfway through our day here, and I think we're curious about, from a global company like yours, a position that you're coming from, your journey and the company's journey. So let's, let's jump right in. You have been at PwC your full career. What is it like working your way up through a massive company like that? So I have been with PwC my entire career, and I was just describing to somebody backstage that the good thing with my job and the career that I've had is every couple of years, I was always doing something different. Mm -hmm. um, so for a few years, I actually started in our audit business. There was a couple of years I worked in human capital. A couple of years, I went over to Japan. A couple of years, I did consulting. A couple of years, I did leadership responsibilities. So the challenge for me was always, how can I create more options for future development? And how do I actually, with every next step, think about multiple options? Rather than it being linear, how do I think about the zigzag of a career path? For me, it was never a conscious decision. I was lucky because I had great sponsors to put me in the opportunities I had, which becomes a really important theme as you think about the leader you want to become and then the role and the environment you want to create in your own organization. When you think about where you are today, was this your end goal ultimately? No, my, my, honestly, when I started with PwC, I was in the mindset, come in, you get two years experience and get the hell out. Um, so I'm surprised I've lasted as long as I have. And I have seriously thought about leaving five or six times during my career. What's always kept me here is I enjoyed the work I was doing. It was always different and interesting. I really enjoyed the people I was working with. And I felt like I was growing, learning, and getting more value. But it was not just the compensation. I was being valued in a good way to create those additional opportunities that gave me an opportunity to, if I ever wanted to leave, I could, but I was definitely getting a lot more opportunities if I stayed, which obviously put me in the position to be in this job today. What advice do you have to maybe some of our entrepreneurs here who have been a lot more mobile in their careers? How can they take that experience and also work their way through a company or, or at, through various companies? So, so the two things I would say is first, anybody in whatever role you are today, either an innovator, a founder, a performer, a management team member uh, at a large organization, a small organization, how do you continually learn? Every interaction is a learning interaction and every intervention you have with somebody is a recruiting opportunity. And it could be somebody you want to recruit to your future organization or your today organization, but it's also an interview of you. Um, so every time you have a chance to see somebody in an elevator bank at a meeting like this, it's a possible interview. Um, likewise, every interaction you have with the person to the left or to the right of you should be a learning opportunity. It's up to you as to what you want to do with that learning, but make sure you are a continuously learning mindset, a continuously interviewing mindset, and a continually recruiting mindset and expand your network, that's gonna create options for you no matter where your career path goes or where your company ends up going. On that note, when it comes to refining that, that elevator pitch, what have you found works? When you speak to entrepreneurs, what do you think works? So, so to me, it is a combination of what is it that you do that is unique, um, and that goes to the company and the organization and the product or serving you're bringing, but more importantly, as an investor, as a service provider, as a business partner, I'm interested in the person. Um, the product you have today, the service you have today, it might have a lifespan of five years. The world is changing way too fast. Successful organizations are gonna be the ones that are most agile. Likewise, the successful people are the ones that are gonna be most agile. That's why you've gotta always be in this learning mindset and adopt accordingly because what I tell people we even within PwC, I can't guarantee the job you have today is even going to be there three years from now. So uh, what I am interested in is can you show that you have taken a risk, done something different, demonstrated that success continuously with every new situation you've been in. Likewise, an innovator, an entrepreneur has to demonstrate multiple times that they can learn fast, fail fast, and move on to the next thing and then ultimately be successful. How much of that, and maybe you can speak from your experience here, is being interested in beyond just your day-to-day -day work? Is it important to have passions or interests at least besides what you're doing for your company? So I would tell you that I do think it's important to be more well-rounded. Um, when we step back, and I'll use PwC as an example, what we said a couple of years ago is we want people to be a professional within our organization there's five things they have to focus on. 
One is, do you have the technical acumen? So this becomes the subject matter expertise that you are part of. Two is the business acumen. And today I would say that business acumen has to include digital acumen, digital IQ. Third is, do you have global acumen? The world is becoming, even though we have nationalism and populism, it is a very small place in terms of people trying to leverage supply chain, customer experience, or otherwise. And if you don't understand culture and business in multiple locations, you're no longer relevant. Fourth is relationship skills. And then finally, it's leadership, self-initiated leadership. And this goes to how do you take care of yourself, your own mental well-being, do you have flexibility, are you managing work and life and flexibility that's coming from it? And can you be that whole person? Mm -hmm. And if you are not that whole person, you're limiting yourself, I think, in terms of the opportunities for future success as well as the subject matter expertise that's there. On the digital skills, we are, of course, at a, at a tech event here. Are there particular skills that you say, this is an absolute essential qualification for someone or for you that you found was essential in adapting throughout your career? Um, I would say no. So to me, the technology world is moving so fast that you know, an expertise in one technology might be evaporated tomorrow because the life stands pretty small. What I would look for is more raw um, talent in terms of an intellectual curiosity to know what's coming, how can I learn it quickly, how can I manage it effectively, how can I leverage it effectively, how can I adopt it effectively, and then be ready for the next thing. So it's this continued evolution and upskilling that's needed. So the thing we're doing, for example, in PwC is increasing everybody's digital fitness. The way we're doing that for 230,000 people is asking them to take a self-assessment test, but then leverage YouTube videos, self-learning, and all kinds of different collaboration tools to self-initiate the learning, to be smarter on blockchain, smarter on artificial intelligence, smarter on um, 3D printing or drone technology. And it's the combination of all of those technologies that's going to actually enable the future innovation and the future success of an individual or for that matter, the future success of an organization. What is the response that you get at PwC from some of those trainings? Is it divided among ages? Is it divided among countries? What, what's your response? What's so the... we, we've got, just so you understand, there's 230,000 people in PwC in 100 and some odd countries around the world, but the average age is 27. So it's a really young organization on a relative scale and much different than what people probably would expect. What's interesting is actually there's no a lot of differentiation amongst the age classes. There's definitely though an ease of adoptability. So what we have to do is make sure that the leadership teams really are enabling the use of technologies and enabling innovation to happen and do it from the bottoms up. And their job as a more senior leader is actually to create that environment. The, leaders at a younger age are actually responsible to do a couple of things. One is demonstrate those, those skills, demonstrate those technologies, and what we ask of them, reverse mentor those that don't understand what to do and how to do it. And there's a big opportunity to do sponsorship from the top down and reverse mentoring from the bottoms up. And this way you get the collective team aligned around what we're trying to accomplish in transforming our business, which has historically been a human capital business, to a combination of humanity and technology and data to be relevant for the future. Organizationally, has it been difficult to come up with this idea that someone at the bottom could teach someone at the top of the rankings? So it's probably been more difficult depending on the country you're in. And that's why global acumen is very important. Um, some countries are probably a little, little less um, problematic in that space. Others are much more respective of age and title. So if you think about uh, Japan, as an example, very respectful of age and tenure and title, that becomes a lot more of a challenge. So to get a leadership team to think differently and create the right environment becomes a higher hurdle of success compared to um, a country in Africa where the average age is much less and there's not as much bureaucracy or historical relevance, that becomes a less of an issue for them to deal with. So that's why it's important for you to make sure that when you think about these themes, it's not one size fits all. You actually have to make it very local. You have to be as local as you possibly can when interacting with clients and interacting with your people. And you have to be very relevant to say, what's my culture today? What's my core competency today? What do I want it to evolve to as opposed to a one size fits all? 
If it's a one size fits all, you're doomed for failure in various parts of the world. What advice do you have to some of the entrepreneurs or startups here who are smaller scale, but who want to encourage every employee to try to be a leader, to try to have them take ownership of where they're working? How is that possible when you don't have the structure that you have in a massive global company? So, so maybe my first proposition would be leadership is not a title, but an action. Um, and the more the leaders that do have the title can talk about and evidence with storytelling how leaders have evolved regardless of title and age, and the more you can say that's the good behavior we expect, and oh, by the way, that's the recognition we're giving to those people, the more likely you are to emulate and scale consistency of leadership capabilities. Um, the second thing I would say is that as a leader, you have to define the culture and the expectation of the people in your organizations. So you have to land your purpose, you have to land your values, and you have to land the expected behaviors. And define that. What I do in our organization is say, if you want to be an average performer, go do the consulting project or the audit project the way it was done last year. If you want to be the leader of the future, I want you to be sought after. If you're sought after, you're always in recruitment mode or interview mode. What does it take to be sought after? You thought about the problem you're trying to solve for, you've leveraged your network, you've reached out to 20 other teams that have the same issue, you've got great knowledge right now, you are going to a client and interacting, and oh, by the way, I want you to impress that client so much they want to hire you. I don't want you to take the job, but I want them to be in a position they want to hire you. And I want you to take the knowledge you learned and then go back and share it with other teams. You do that, the client seeks you out, the other teams seek you out, someday as a leader, someday as a follower, you're sought after. The more you're sought after, the more career progression you're going to get. Just like an innovator and an entrepreneur here, in terms of those that are doing it, the more you are doing those things and thinking about not yourself and your company and your idea, but rather how you're solving systemic issues or solving a sector's issues or a segmentation issue or a country issue, the more you're going to be sought after as a broader thinker. The more you're sought after, the more opportunities that are going to come your way naturally, and the more opportunities, Kenley, are going to come your way in terms of people wanting to draw your thinking and your natural skill sets into the conversation. So hearing your thoughts on that might help explain how PwC has become such a powerhouse beyond just consulting and auditing now. It's, it's a massive company. Is there an idea that they can serve more beyond its kind of original business purpose? How much, how big do you want to get? So to me, it's not around being big. Um, it's about impact, it's about relevancy. And for us to be sustainable, uh, we have to be more agile. So a couple of years ago, we asked ourselves four strategic questions. How will I remain relevant over the next couple of decades? Where will we grow and how should we invest differently than we've done before? Where will I get the IP and the human capital to enable it to happen? And how can I disrupt ourselves and not be disrupted? In order to answer those questions, we had to say, what are those big trends? Demographic shifts, the impact on technology, the scarcity of resources, um, the shifting of capital markets from west to east, and then we said to ourselves, now let's answer those questions with those trends in mind. But it caused us to reshape our purpose. So our purpose actually was crowdsourced, as were our values. We actually used to have a purpose that probably went to the audit business and the assurance business. Today, our purpose got redefined. What does the world need? What's the world requiring of organizations like us? And what's our assets? And we shaped that to be, how do we help enable trust and how do we solve some big important problems? That required us to think differently about the values and the behaviors. So what we did there was to go out to 230,000 people and say, what are your values today personally? What do you think the values of PwC are today? And if this is our purpose going forward, what do our values need to be tomorrow? And then we engaged probably 80% of our organization, which was great because it was bottoms up, as opposed to you know, me and a small team creating and trying to force it down and enable that buy-in. And I don't care if you're 40 people or 230,000 people, the more you can get the ground swell from the bottom up and get people aligned around what you're trying to do, the easier the execution and the easier the alignment will be, the better the participation will be in the personal brands that will be created, and that personal brand will be aligned to the organizational brand, and you'll have more success. Mm -hmm. And that's where, to me, it's not about our scale and our size, 
It's about our relevancy and the value proposition. I don't want to be the biggest professional services firm. I'd rather be the most relevant, most valued and valuable professional services firm in the defined spaces that we think the world needs us going forward. I'm, I'm glad you raised the issue of trust because so much of what we hear about today is there's a lack of trust, particularly in many of the bigger tech companies. Privacy and data issues are in the news every single day. Yep. What are you doing at PwC to consistently remember that when you talk about your brand? So um, our brand is defined on trust and integrity. If I am not trusted, I'll never get a phone call to go do a piece of work. If for whatever reason we're doing something with our clients' data, if I ever lose that data, I have the same pump problem that the technology houses do. So I am out of business. So first and foremost is to make sure our organization understands brand, risk management, and protecting that brand and enhancing that brand at all costs. And transferring from that people agenda to a data, technology, and people agenda becomes important. And what 230,000 people have in terms of their role and their responsibility becomes important. Our own surveys around digital and cyber and privacy, the issue is not the technologies, the issue is actually the policies, procedures, and the personal behaviors. So step number one is that. Step number two is we have got to be as good as the most trusted or those that aspire to be the most trusted. So we have to have a level of um, dependency pro and privacy and cyber as governments and financial services organizations. So we have to put ourselves and expect us to be here. If we make a mistake, we have to admit it, we have to fix it, and we have to commit to never do it again. But we are going to make mistakes. There will be problems. The question for anybody in a crisis in this area is to own up, up to it quickly, fix it, and commit to make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's where I think speed is of the essence. And financial service companies and technology companies today are probably the ones that have the most issues. It is not the issue that has been created, it's how you handle the issue. Likewise, in PwC, is all about how you handle the issues going forward. I'd like to talk about that bigger picture when we talk about regulation and we talk about making sure that consumers are put first. Here in Europe, we've heard a lot about Europe's data privacy law, GDPR. Do you see this as a step in the right direction? Do you think other countries need to start really cracking down to protect privacy? And what risks does that pose for startups? So I think you got to break it down into pieces. First off, the EU clearly with GDPR and others definitely has taken a leading edge in terms of how do we think about the privacy issues. But let's remember, um, we have to have a much more clear debate of the pros and cons of whatever rules and regulations we have to put in. If you want to leverage data the way many in the audience want to leverage data, there's a negative to that in terms of, well, that then goes at the expense of privacy, which may go at the expense of the consumer and whether they're willing to give that data. Likewise, if the consumer wants more value, there's more value in having more access to data. So those trade-offs become really important. The difference between the way the EU thinks about it and the way China thinks about it, radically different. So what I will tell you is, as a world, as a society, we have to now think about fragmentation of rules. Everybody is trying to write the rules differently. So the way the US is doing it is much different the way China is different, the way the EU is doing it differently the way India eventually will do it differently and the way Russia is doing it differently. The organizational issue that many of you in the audience, no matter how small, no matter how large, no matter if you're a startup or, or established, you have to navigate those rules and they are going to be a new changing environment that you'll have to be um, much more fragmented in terms of how you do it and think about how you want to apply those rules regardless of where you're doing business right now. Likewise, PwC and others like us will have to deal with the same kind of challenges going forward. But this is where the business community has to do more. Governments can't do this stuff by themselves. In fact, I would say governments are tainted by maybe trying to get the politicians to do what's fundamentally right for the 2% to get voted on the next time. So that's why the business community has to step up and to be much more engaged in these dialogues. And an organization like PwC, part of our role is to convene people to talk about this stuff. We may not even have the answers, but the more convening and the more dialogue, the better off the answer is going to be, no matter what rule and regulation you're talking about. So do you see the role of CEOs or CFOs or COOs, anyone at the top of a company, or even someone in a management position at a tech company to really try to come up with these ideas for how to deal with the ethics of AI or privacy? Or is that role becoming increasingly important from a business side versus I, government? I think it's important for three reasons. Uh, first, 
the business community has much more better insights of the pragmatic and practical realities of how AI gets applied as opposed to some politician and arguably in some countries even the regulators. Second, our politicians can't come up with the right rules because they'll be too far removed from how do you balance and, and strike the right balance around these things. Third, our politicians today, and, and no disrespect from whatever country you may be from or what political parties you may have affiliation to, they will try to come up with a politically correct answer that hits the media test or the political election test and there, thereby requires the business community to step up more so and be much more of a, a vocal and more clairvoyant voice in the debate. Some countries, they don't even allow for that to happen anymore, so the business community has to step up and, and, and fill a void and maybe even be a counterforce in some countries to the voice of the politicians. And that's a really important thing that's not only responsible for future rules and regulations, I'm going to say it's responsible for just values in general. What do organizations stand for? What do they mean in terms of their own purpose? And at times that might be different than what an elected official or an appointed official actually stands for. And that's why I think the role of the CEO, his or her management team and their boards have to be much more visible in terms of being relevant, prevailing, and purpose-oriented and driven to what's right for society and all their stakeholders going forward which puts a real big burden on the role and responsibility of a CEO today. And is that something a CEO has to determine really from the start, being a startup all the way up till PwC? One of the hardest things today for CEO is the, the, the implications of social media. Social media has allowed for anybody without facts to be a judge and a jury. The challenge for the CEO is what, what topic to get engaged on, when do I choose to engage and not engage, and when do I choose to defend? or maybe even be proactive in what I want to talk about, and maybe even defending on my own choice. I will argue trust, which you talked about earlier, is not going to come from CEOs with a title. Trust is going to come from the peer-to-peer -peer interaction. The more your stakeholders can do your talking, the better off you are. And that goes to a startup with eight people in it today, to a organization with 250,000 people around the world. How you choose to use your voice and on what topics and what mechanisms is a really important role for the CEOs to think about, founders to think about, and innovators to think about going forward. Bob, I think that's a good place to leave it. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate Thanks. it. Enjoy the rest of the time. Thanks. Thank you.